Praise God. We can read together from the book of Luke chapter 7 from verse 1 to 10. When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servants, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Luke chapter 6, from verse 36 to 50. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she bought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had... He said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debts canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she went my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's the word of God. This is the fourth sermon of the series from Luke that is highlighting Jesus and his ministry on earth. Now, Dr. Symbolic emphasized in the first two sermons the reliability of scripture and its applicability to today and described Jesus as part of the Trinity. Last week, we examined how the teaching and ministry of Jesus were and are completely upside down from the way the rest of the world operates. And this sermon is titled, Jesus and Faith, and it's based on the verses in Luke 7 that Bridget just read. After preaching the sermon on the plain, that's not one that's flying, that's the flat place, which was the subject of the sermon last week, Jesus left the plain and went to Capernaum to the Sea of Galilee. This town um, of probably 1,500 people was considered a large town in that time. Jesus lived there after he left Nazareth. 
And Peter, Andrew, James, and John were living in Capernaum and were fishermen when Jesus called them as disciples. Now, because Capernaum was Jesus' headquarters, he was regularly interacting with others in the town. And that explains why Jesus was available to one of the people we will talk about today, the Roman centurion in verses 7, 1 through 10. We will also describe a prostitute in another town who displayed remarkable faith in Jesus in verses 30, 36 to 50. Before I describe these two encounters, I want you to be thinking about your own faith, your faith in Jesus. Now, most of us come here every Sunday, and the majority of us have done that for five to 20 or more years. Almost all of us would call ourselves believers, meaning that we are certain that Jesus, the Son of God, provided our salvation by dying on the cross to save us from our sins. The belief in salvation is the first step in walking in faith the rest of your life. Once you have been saved, your walk with God will require a deeper faith that will sustain you on that path of being a child of God the rest of your life. We have the word of God that describes all that God promises. Do you read the Bible to know those promises? How strongly do you believe in God's promises? In your own mind and heart, do you trust God to do what he says? Do you face each difficulty and crossword, crossroad, I'm a big crossword player, sorry. Uh, we, we face each difficulty and crossroad with the certainty that God has authority over that situation. Faith in the ability of God and his promises to sustain and protect us in this physical world, I believe, is essential to a Christian. Now, the first faith story for today is the faith of the Roman centurion for the healing of his servant. Centurions were the backbone of the Roman army, and they were considered quite essential in the Roman Empire. Their salaries were 17 times greater than the regular soldiers. That's how valued they were. They were each in charge of a battalion of 100 soldiers, hence the name Centurion. And in 16 of the 18 references to the Centurions that I found in the New Testament, in 16 of them they were viewed positively. Roman centurions were stationed in conquered towns around the empire to maintain loyalty to Caesar. As pagans with no supreme god to worship, I think that some found the monotheistic god of the Jews and the Christians very attractive. Cornelius, the man in Acts 10 who had the visitation of an angel telling him to find Paul, was a centurion who converted to Christianity. The centurions, were sorry, the centurions were entrusted by Caesar to make decisions and interventions in their territories as they saw fit. Caesar had absolute authority. His word was power. But he gave authority to others who acted in his stead. This authority structure attached considerable power to the representatives of Caesar, including the centurions. Ignoring or saying no to a command by a centurion was the same as saying no to Caesar, and the consequences could be the same. The centurion in Luke 7 clearly understood his authority as Caesar's representative. He described how he could order men of many ranks, Roman or not, and they obediently acted on his word. You will see how this viewpoint about the chain of command is a major factor in this story. This centurion had amassed a great favor in the time he had been assigned to Capernaum. 
Although he was an outsider, he was a major contributor to the construction of a beautiful Jewish temple, the ruins of which can still be seen in Capernaum today. I didn't point out when you saw the picture, the aerial view of Capernaum, I think I see that ruin in that picture. Now the ill man that he was asking about was a valued servant. Now I can relate to this to some extent because I have a housekeeper who comes once a week and I feel so blessed because she is a woman with a wonderful work ethic who can see what needs to be done and she does it without being told. And she really cares about me. I value her greatly. I reward her accordingly, and I pray for her. I would expect that many of you have workers at your home or business that you feel great respect and affection for, some who have re reared your children from birth uh, or perhaps safely driven you around for years. That feeling of affection for his servant is what caused the centurion to seek out Jesus, whose power to heal was well known. The centurion asked Jesus to come and save the life of his servant, so we know that the illness must have been dire. Luke writes that the centurion, rather than coming himself, sent a group of Jewish elders to ask Jesus to come. These people, in their earnestness, used the logic that the centurion had earned the right of Jesus' favor. He is worthy for you to grant this to him. This was a presumption in this story that was askew. You see, they came from the belief that one had to earn favor with God by keeping all the rules. They didn't know about the grace of unmerited favor that God has offered through Jesus. So they pled for the centurion on the basis of his good works. He loves our nation, and it was he who built our synagogue, they said. Now the centurion was an outsider and was wealthy. Jesus was mainly ministering to the poor and the lowly. But his ministry and his message were for everyone. So Jesus was perfectly willing to go to the centurion's house. He started off immediately with the representatives. But before he got there, the centurion had had second thoughts and sent another contingent of people to Jesus. The message they were delivering in verses 6 to 8 were, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not fit for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For indeed, I am a man of great authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. Do this, and he does it. Now those words bring us to the central lesson of the centurion's story. And that is the man's faith. When Jesus heard the message brought by the second group, verse 9 says that Jesus marveled, was amazed at this man's faith. Jesus said it was a faith he had not seen in all of, of Israel. Now there were hundreds of people coming to Jesus every day for healing. So why would he marvel at this man's faith? First, <clears throat> the Roman was humble. Though not a believer per se, his heart had been sensitized to God that, that the people around him worshipped. Though a powerful man, he did not even feel worthy to have God's messenger visit him. He had no sense that God owed him anything. The second characteristic of his that is equally important for us to realize is what I described earlier. The military man understood the authority of Caesar that he himself possessed, and therefore he could believe that Jesus had full authority from God to heal the servant. 
the sovereignty of God and God's compassion for men was present in Jesus, as was God's power to heal. The soldier believed Jesus had God's full authority and willingness and could heal by a simple word, even at a physical distance. It's this combination of humility and faith that amazed Jesus. Jesus did heal the servant, as the messengers learned when they returned to the centurion's home. The healing didn't require Jesus' physical presence. That's a good lesson for, regarding faith for us who live in a time when Jesus is no longer physically present on earth. His authority from heaven is as powerful as it was in this story. We can believe that Jesus' power and willingness to act on our behalf is as strong as it was in that time. Now let's turn our attention to the second faith story in Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. Jesus accepted an invitation to have dinner in the home of a Pharisee named Simon. Who knows why the Pharisee invited him? Perhaps to trap him? Maybe to get a feather in his cap for having a famous man in his house. But Jesus was operating in grace, not emotions. And he accepted the invitation of this man who might at some point be bringing him before the Sanhedrin. Like the, centu like the centurion, the Pharisee was a man of means. His dining room would have been an inner room but there would have been an access room near the door where others could enter the house and wait to be seen by the Pharisee. There were other guests present, but their presence is not necessarily a factor in this story. I can imagine the underlying tension in the small talk that was taking place. Then, without any introduction or permission, a woman enters the room and go straight to the end of Jesus' couch. The tension that existed before was escalated immediately among these three, the Pharisee, this woman, and Jesus. We might say the sage, the streetwalker, and the savior. The Pharisee knew who she was. She knew who Jesus was. And Jesus knew who she was too, but he didn't recoil from her, which interestingly made the Pharisee secretly doubt if Jesus could really be a prophet. Now Jesus had been preaching in many places in the area, and his message had been, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy hearted. It's possible that this woman had been to one or more of those gatherings and saw this as her opportunity to bring her weariness and her heavy heartedness to Jesus as an act of faith that she could be forgiven. Immediately as she entered, she became very emotional, weeping deeply, so deeply that she couldn't speak. Rather than taking Jesus' hand, she dropped down and reached for his feet dripping her tears on them. She took down her hair and began wiping her tears from his feet, essentially washing his feet. The woman even kissed his feet as she sobbed. She had come with a perfume, probably a precious ointment, and applied the perfume to his feet. This is a highly emotional act of contrition. This broken soul came in faith to bear her sin before Jesus. Now, without saying a word, but by her actions, her faith in Jesus' ability to heal her soul resulted in her salvation. Jesus said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The salvation that was granted was lost on the learned host. 
His perception of the event was that the woman was that, was that the woman was making a sexual advance to Jesus. He was thinking about all the religious rules she had broken, such as taking down her hair, when according to the Talmud, a woman could only let down her hair before her husband. The Pharisee couldn't believe in freedom from sins. Jesus turned to Simon, knowing his thoughts, and told him a parable. The parable described two debtors who both owed a moneylender. One owed a huge amount, and the other one-tenth of that amount. When neither could pay their debt, for some reason, the moneylender forgave their loans. Jesus asked the Pharisee, so which one of the debtors do you think had the greater love for the moneylender? Simon got this one. He said that the one who had been forgiven the most would be the most appreciative. But what he missed was the irony of the actors in the room. The prostitute had put her faith in Jesus, and Jesus had forgiven her. When neither could pay their debt, sorry, the, um, the Pharisee put his faith in the law, and since he was an enforcer of the law, he could not comprehend that one could just be forgiven without a sacrifice. He was wrapped up in legalism, and that distorted his thinking. The woman's faith had led her to do all the things that the, that the host would normally do in that culture. Give a kiss as a welcome gesture, provide water for washing the feet, and provide a scented oil for refreshment. Simon was inhospitable, judgmental, and he didn't recognize his own sin. He lacked faith in Jesus' message of salvation. These two stories about faith represent two categories of faith. The woman in this second story had faith in the redemptive power of salvation. The centurion story exemplified faith in God's care and concern for his people and God's assurance that his authority over their lives is absolute. Now, it had been my plan to interview several people about their faith stories to use as examples in this sermon. Then, three weeks ago, I had coffee with one of our elders, principally to talk about our 45-plus group, but our conversation expanded into our respective histories. Not knowing that I was scheduled to preach this week, he told me that I needed to include my history in my next sermon. Now, five to six years ago, I did share some of my walk, my faith walk from the pulpit. But at that time, many of you were not attending church here. So I am including some of my story that includes how I got to Kenya and what has happened since. And I apologize to those who heard it previously. Let me start by saying that when I was 12 years old, the Spirit put Kenya in my heart. Now, I was reared in the church Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, Sunday school, Bible school. But when I was little, I accepted Jesus several times in church and Sunday school. But when I was nine, I made a clear decision and asked my dad to pray with me for salvation. I was born in a small town uh, in Kansas of 1,500 people, and during my fifth grade in school, my family moved to the huge city of 35,000 people. I had no idea of the big world we live in. I can't tell you exactly how I knew I was to come to Kenya at age 12, but I have known since I was in grade five that God wanted me to be here. By the way, I also knew since I was six and in first grade that I wanted to be a teacher. I used to make my younger siblings and my cousins sit down and play school, and I loved it. In the US, a teaching certificate for any level requires a university degree. 
So I ended up being the first person in my extended family to ever go to university. That teaching degree, that teaching degree and two subsequent graduate degrees opened the door to so many international experiences and what is initially what brought me to Kenya. I first came here in 19, 1993 as an education professor at the new Moy University. Now someday I may share that miraculous story of how that happened, but it's too long for what is remaining in this service. I will tell you that I had a two-year contract to start a new program to train physics and chemistry teachers. But after just six months, a letter appeared on my desk essentially saying, Dr. Stone, we don't think your contract is valid and you need to go home. Now having given up my university position in the States, selling my house and telling my family goodbye, believing I would be here the rest of my life, I was devastated. I resisted leaving for several months, living here on a tourist visa being followed by CID, having my phone tapped, because I knew beyond doubt that God had called me to Kenya. Then one day, I was picked up by CID and sent to the head of immigration in Nairobi with a sealed letter that for all I knew said, when this woman arrives, please shoot her. <laughs> well, that head of immigration didn't shoot me, but he did say he didn't think they wanted me in Eldoret anymore, and I probably should just leave. In my heart and my mind, I fought that with all I had. And I really questioned just what was God doing. I said I couldn't leave till the writing was on the wall. Now, the story of leaving is another miraculous and long one for another day. But let it suffice to say that one day I woke up and I realized I was looking at my meager belongings and deciding what I should sell and what I should take with me. I realized that for the first time, I was considering leaving. Two days later, my mother called to say my dad was having life-changing surgery and I needed to come home. That was the writing on the wall. To this day, I do not know what predicated all the Moy University debacle, except that God was testing if I would believe that he had my best in mind. It was high season, and tickets to the US were scarce, so I booked a ticket through Cyprus where I had worked previously. I spent a night with old friends and called home to check on my dad's condition, only to hear my mother say, your dad doesn't have to have that surgery. There was a mistake in the diagnosis. Too late. I was on my way to the States. But I believe that God was protecting me from something. I can tell you that the next seven years I was back in the US, I never felt I belonged there. I was productive, I had the best paying job I'd ever had, I played a significant role in a church that God led me to, I did lots of traveling, participated in some volunteer community service, and developed some steadfast and long-lasting friends. My life was full, but this is where my heart was. Eventually, I heard about a teaching position at Roslyn Academy in Nairobi. That's another long faith story, but let me just say that God did some amazing maneuvering to get me that job. I came back to Kenya in 2001 and taught at Roslyn for two years. The third week, I came to see what Karura was all about, and I've been here since. I have traveled to many places, lived in a few countries, and I can tell you that I have never been able to walk in faith like I can here. I know that this is where God wants me. But even so, 
Every two years, I have to apply for a new work permit that allows me to stay here. The first year after I left Roslyn and was on my own for a work permit, most permits were being denied. But I got mine in 12 days. Now, there have been some years like that when God lets it all go smoothly. Thank you. <laughs> and several other years, like in 2016, when there are hitches in the permit process, and it looks like I will have to leave. He reminds me that I must trust him and believe that he has the best in mind for me. In 2014, I applied for Kenyan citizenship. Now with citizenship, I would never have to apply for that work permit again. But communication in Swahili is required. I have hired tutors, I have stacks of flashcards, I know much about the Swahili grammar, but I simply have not been able to communicate in spoken Swahili, principally because I can't understand when spoken to in Swahili. If I am denied citizenship, it's very high stakes. There are no options, at least as far as the government is concerned. If denied citizenship, I cannot apply for any more work permits, and I can't apply for permanent residency. I would have to leave. However, I will say that Pastor Patricia and her husband have agreed to adopt me in that case. <laughs> the stakes are so high that in December last year, after considerable prayer, I withdrew my citizenship application before they could call me for the interview that involved that Swahili conversation. That meant that in June this year, I had to apply for the work permit again. It was granted in 12 days. <laughs> now God's plan may be to keep my faith active by applying for those work permits the rest of my life. I don't understand it all, but I know I am where God wants me. Now from this rather long testimony about my faith walk, I, will hope, I hope that you will take away the message I know that my God has sovereignty over my life. He put Kenya in my heart. He gave me faith to move here twice. And he has given me such a rich life in Kenya as evidence that this is where I belong. The difficulties in being able to remain here keep me believing, keep me acting in faith, and keep me relying on God. So that's my faith story. What's yours? What has God placed in your heart that doesn't seem to be working out? What circumstances are testing your faith perhaps to the nth degree. Scripture tells us that God has created you to love him and to rely on him as your savior, your provider, your protector, and your sustainer. You, as an individual, have been given a measure of faith that is unique to you, which is sufficient to keep you relying on your creator who loves you and has created you to worship and serve him. You are able to do all things according to his purpose if you believe that. Believe it. Thank you. <laughs>